The Cosmic Highway. God's Word for Today and Beyond. Truths you might not have heard before. Truths that might be considered as fringe, controversial, blurry, or just unbelievable. This is the Unfiltered Biblical. You are watching the video series, Eternity, From There and Back Again, God's Plan Through the Ages, A Supernatural Conflict. Hello and welcome to the Cosmic Bible, God's Word for Today and Beyond, in this video series, Eternity. From there and back again, God's plan through the ages, a supernatural conflict. I am Steve Kibler here at Dr. S.W. Kibler Ministries, thanking you all for joining me for this video. And I want to also thank those who support this ministry financially and through prayer. You are a blessing. Well, once again, I'll just show these uh, two slides uh, that uh, kind of give a, an outline of where we're going, eternity from there and back again. You can see it starts uh, before creation and ends after the millennial kingdom. So we are in uh, age five, uh, at mankind under law. And so here's the second one that we have inserted into this timeline, into the prophetic timeline. The age in which we live is here in purple. And that's called the mystery, the age of mystery or uh, age of grace. And that's where we're living today. So I just want to make those available to you so you can see them. And here we go. So this is uh, video number 26 in this series and part four of age five, Mankind Under the Law from Exodus through Revelation. So uh, I have found that the term law, as used in the biblical text, and as we're taught in church and Christianity and so forth, is greatly misunderstood specifically today in contemporary Christianity. So that's what we're going to cover today. What is the law? So there have been many attempts to explain and understand what is meant by the law or the law of Moses. In reality, what is meant by law depends upon the context in which it is used in the biblical text itself. So we're going to look at it this way. The law can also be referred to in context as the Pentateuch or the first five books of the Bible. And that is Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Now it's called Pentateuch because that's the Greek word. That's just a fancy way to say it. But in the Hebrew, in the Jews, they call it the Torah. The Torah, first five books of the biblical text. So these books were written, as accepted, by Moses, except maybe for the last portion of Deuteronomy, because it tells about the death of Moses, so I don't think that Moses wrote it after he was dead. But for the most part, it's pretty well accepted. Uh, in conservative circles that uh, Moses was the author of these books, uh, although there may have been further editing later. But anyway, the Jews call it the Torah, which means instruction, instruction, which that is what's often translated into our English word as law. So if you think instruction, that's really what we're looking at, instruction. Um, so these uh, five books, they lay the foundation for the coming of the Messiah in that here God chooses and brings into being the nation of Israel as his chosen people out of all the other nations that had been scattered at the Tower of Babel. Remember that. So as God's heritage, his chosen people, descendants of Jacob, Israel became the custodians of his written word, or the Old Testament. And uh, they were the, also the recipients of what are known as covenants of promise. And 
the lineage, as we mentioned, of the Messiah. So these texts in the first five books of the Bible introduce most, if not all, of the important themes that will reoccur throughout the entirety of the biblical text, as well as all of the different in individuals' characters and narratives that continue to be relevant even for us today. Now, I know there's a movement within modern Christianity today to basically ignore the Old Testament because it's not relevant, and I will stand in firm opposition to that. The Old Testament is absolutely important because without it, the New Testament makes no sense. We must have the Old Testament, the Hebrew uh, Bible, because it just lays the foundation for everything. Without the foundation, the house cannot stand. So, the understanding, uh, the Bible requires us understanding the first five books, the Pentateuch, the Torah, the instructions. Uh, the division into the five separate volumes, it's, uh, they think that maybe Greek translators put them into the order they are. But Jews today divide, the Jews divide the text into 54 sections, the first five books. And the 54 sections called Parsha. And uh, one of these sections is read each week of the year. Uh, with a couple of weeks doubled up, and that way it goes throughout the whole year. So we read in uh, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. That is the uh, creation. Let's see what I have here. Yeah, the creation, departure, and then the Levitical law concerning Levites, and then a renumbering of the people or the numbering of the people and then the Deuteronomy is a re-giving of the law. It's a recounting of the law. And that's the first five books. The original Hebrew titles are a little bit different than ours. It's Bereshit, Shemot, uh, here they are, and uh, Bayerkra, uh, Bamidar, and Devarim, and which means in the beginning, names he called in the wilderness, and then things are words. So that's kind of how the, the Jews would refer to this. So the major themes in the Torah, in the law, uh, looking at it as the first five books of the Bible, uh, we have this idea of covenant. And it's a very important uh, aspect. Now, there are a couple of ways that this is looked at within Christianity. One is covenant theology, and the other is not. And I don't uh, follow the covenant theological uh, line. I tend to look at it as a biblical line that I that I follow and that more dispensational. But the idea of covenants, and the covenant is really a promise that's made between one two people. It can be unilateral or bilateral. Unilateral means one person is in the covenant to do something regardless of what the other person does. A bilateral covenant is if you do this, then I'll do this other thing. So it's a back and forth. But this idea of covenants is woven throughout all of the biblical text and the laws in the first five books of the Bible, in the law itself. And it's an idea that also continues to play a very important role in the rest, the entirety of the biblical text. So a covenant is really a contract or a treaty, if you want to call that. And it's between God and man or mankind, humans, either all humans or one specific group, right? Because the Lord made certain uh, contracts or uh, covenants with the people of Israel only. And then some of these covenants are made with humanity as a whole. So the law then generally refers to, you know, it can uh, uh, specifically mean uh Covenants made with the people Israel as well. But it also means what the Lord has promised to all people. So we have to get a little bit more specific in just a minute. Now there are seven major covenants, uh, eight major, I'm sorry. There are several, but there's eight major covenants. Eight. Um, and I'm dogmatic on that, but this is the way that I see the biblical text. 
Now I've noticed that there's a majority of the newer charts. If you look up, you you go online and you look up the covenants of the Bible, you'll find anywhere from three, four, five, six to seven, and there's fewer and fewer that are showing these eight, um, these eight covenants. And I'll show you the one that they omit, and it's devastating the one that they they omit. So we're going to look at these eight covenants now, and here we go. So the the, and these are contained within the Torah, right, within the law. There's the Edenic covenant, which is the one in innocence. And we've talked about these, as we've gone through the Edenic and the Edemic and the Noic and the Abrahamic, right? We've, we've looked at these, we've talked about them, and now we're down here with the Mosaic. Edenic was made in the Garden of Eden in perfection, and man was told to be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, to subdue the earth and have dominion over the earth and the creatures, right? And, that, and to not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil in the middle of the garden. That was the Edenic uh, covenant. The next covenant is the Edemic covenant, and that was after the fall. After man failed to do what was required in the first one, there's the second one. This is the one that is most often excluded. Okay, we'll get to that in just a minute. And in this one, the Edemic Covenant has the, the, the curses in the requirements of mankind. After sin entered into the world, it also includes a curse on Satan, or the serpent, if you remember. And that's man under conscience, as we looked at uh, in our study. Then we looked at the Noahic Covenant, and that's uh, human government, and that was after the flood. Then we looked at the Abrahamic covenant, which was that covenant or promise or his family and descendants. Now we're looking at the Mosaic law. This is where we are now, Mosaic. And this was also known as the law. And there are several references here that you can see on the screen. The next uh, covenant is, oh, look at that. That's not working so good, is it? Hmm. There's the Davidic and then the Palestinian. I don't know why that's totally off the board. Let me see. Maybe it's just the way I'm looking at it. Let me try to back up out of here. Oh, man, I didn't want to do that. I am just, I just wanted to close this one. There we go. Now let me look at it. Nope, it's still looking the same. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, the Davidic covenant is in 2 Samuel 7, uh, 14 through 16, and that says that a descendant of King David will always be on the throne. And we know that Yeshua, the Messiah, is the direct descendant of David. So the Lord, uh, God kept us right there. Then we have the Palestinian covenant, which is Deuteronomy 30, which is about the acquiring of the land, all the land that was promised by the Lord, uh, not only to Abraham, but to the children of Israel. And not all of it uh, has actually been conquered yet, but it will be. And so that moves into the future. And then we have the new covenant which is not in effect now it's not the new covenant we are not under the new covenant it's very specific the new covenant is made with israel specifically and it is in the future it is in uh in the millennial and that's when it takes place and then it lasts from there until the end of time but we're not living in the new covenant now and i know that will cause some of you a heart attack but uh, read uh, read uh, the the biblical text about the new covenant, and you can see that's made specifically with the people of Israel and of Judah, and that is the way it is because the Lord says what He means means what He says, and that's exactly what He's going to do. So, the covenant most admitted in in the uh, what I have seen online is the Edemic Covenant. And I found that at the Edemic Covenant, that's the one at the fall when man has sinned. And I found that often what they've done is instead of having the Edenic Covenant, that one was in perfection, they call that the Edemic Covenant and they skip over Genesis chapter 3 and move right on to the Noahic Covenant or the covenant with Noah uh, uh, after the flood. So they skip a significant portion of the biblical text that is absolutely foundational. It means that they omit the, they omit the origin of sin, its consequences are omitted, 
and the promises, the covenant that's made against the serpent, Satan, and what was told to man and woman at that time, and it omits, it omits the promise of the seed who would crush the serpent on the head. So the whole concept and, and reality of the need for a savior is being omitted from the list of the covenants because it's not being included in many, many of them. And I think that's absolutely devastating because in Genesis chapter 3, uh, we read this. The Lord said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and above all beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity, that is warfare. This is where spiritual warfare actually <laughs> originates and the Lord originates the warfare. We've talked about that before. The Lord puts warfare between the serpent and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. To the woman, he said, I will surely multiply your pain and childbearing and pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire sh uh, shall be contrary to your husband, but he shall rule over you. To Adam, he said, because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. So, this is the hinge upon which the whole of the biblical text lies. Uh, is right here in the, the, the Adamic covenant. Without it, it's impossible to understand God's plan through the ages. But it is slowly being removed uh, from many of the, the charts of the covenants. But I am telling you, so you know, Genesis 3 is, is very fundamental in understanding the rest of the Bible. If you cannot grasp Genesis chapter 3, you can't grasp anything that's in the rest of the biblical text. So let me see what I have here next. The promise perspective is next. And that is the, uh, under the Abrahamic covenant. Uh, do you remember we talked about that dispensation or that age? Uh, this everlasting covenant includes all people, all people. And we read this in Genesis chapter. <clears throat> oh, gee, I don't have that one under, do I? Hmm. Okay, well, here we go. Genesis 12, 2 through 3. It says, I will make of you a great nation and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and him who dishonors you I will curse and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. And uh, all families of the earth means every nation, every race of people, every ethnicity, both Jew and Gentile, everybody it will be blessed here. And of that particular passage, the Apostle Paul writes in Galatians uh, chapter 3, verses 15 through 16, it says, uh, to give a human example, brothers, even when a man made a covenant, no one annuls it or adds to it once it has been ratified. Now the promise says we're made to Abraham and to his offspring. It does not say to offsprings, referring to many, but referring to one, offspring, and to your offspring, who is Christ. And then in Galatians 2, uh, 3, 25 through 29, we read, But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. For in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. For as many of you as were uh, immersed into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek or Gentile. There is neither slave nor free. There is no male and female. For you are all one in Yeshua, Mashiach, Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to promise. So, this promise of covenant perspective is imperative. But without the Edemic uh, covenant piece uh, from Genesis chapter 3, there's no need for the promised seed. You see where I'm going? So, it's really important to know your biblical text, to know the Bible. 
and what it says because there is uh, this tendency for pieces to be strategically omitted and removed and not spoken about. So we're going to move on now to the Mosaic Covenant. And uh, in it, God makes, uh, it's a highly detailed covenant. Uh, and we'll, we're going to drill down on this in just a minute. Uh, the Mosaic Covenant, and it's made with a specific people, with the descendants of Jacob, with the children of Israel. It's not made with the whole world. The Mosaic Covenant is made with a particular group of people within the world. And not the to, not to Gentiles, but only the Hebrews, only the descendants of Jacob, the children of Israel. A covenant that has many extensive provisions in it um, that the people are to obey, and based on their obedience, there are promises of blessings from Yahweh Elohim. So one of the things you see here on your screen is... Uh, monolity or monotheism and there has been this teaching that Judaism and Christianity are monotheistic which means there's only one God of any kind but ancient Judaism in the biblical text as we've read was not monotheistic it was a, a, a monolatry in that uh, monolatry means that there are multiple gods, but only one should be worshipped, and that is Yahweh Elohim, the Lord God Most High. Only one should be worshipped. There are other smaller entities, but only one creator God, Yahweh Elohim, and we know him as Yeshua. So this is a, a stumbling block that I had to work myself through just by literally looking at the biblical text and saying, okay, it teaches there are these other entities and even Yahweh Elohim calls them God. So they must exist or God is, is a liar, right? Either God's a liar or he's telling the truth. So if he's telling the truth, there are these other gods, but he is the most high God. He is the creator God, and he is the one that you were to worship, right? Only him. So there may be other these other entities that are called gods, but only Yahweh Elohim, Yeshua, is to be worshipped uh, because he is creator God and he is a sustainer. So we... We've kind of looked at that before, and, and I've covered that in, in several different videos, but that's important for us to look at here, that the Lord God, when he speaks, and you will see, if we look at some other verses in another video, that the Lord says, don't worship these other gods. They must exist. He didn't say, it's not specific, don't worship idols. It's don't worship these other gods. So the Lord is saying, no. Nope. I am the Most High God. I am the Creator God, and I am the one who is worthy to be worshipped. So, generally speaking, kind of a review: the law, of, the law of Moses, or the law, can refer to the first five books of the Bible, or it can refer to the Torah. Right? That's what is the Torah. It's called the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible. However, we're going to get more strictly speaking the law of Moses can refer only to the 600 plus commandments and regulations that we find in Exodus Leviticus numbers and Deuteronomy basically those that Moses received uh, from uh, the Lord God himself those 600 plus commandments and the regulations. So we're going to look at that piece, the law as commandments, these things, the law of Moses as commandments. And they were given specifically to the people of Israel, the children of Israel, not to the world, but only to them. Because he told them, if you do these things, if you keep my commandments, then you will be to me a kingdom of priests, a holy nation, a special possession. If they, so it was given to them. So these are the laws of God. And Moses was the one whom God used to bring them to the children of Israel. 
So we find that they are broken into several categories, basically three categories. The law that Moses received, Mount Sinai, the law can be broken into three basic categories. And this is civil laws. And these are the regulations of daily living and societal, the government, right? Social governments, the civil government. And they cover the full range of things from property to uh, how to treat your uh, employees or servants, uh, marriage, uh, restitution, and so forth. So those are civil laws, just regular daily living life, how you're just, how the children is or would just to get along with each other, basically. And then there were the ceremonial laws, and those were basically going, uh, they're called, it's also called the Levitical law. It's a piece within the Mosaic law for the Levites who were to uh, offer these particular sacrifices and have the, the service of the tabernacle, right? And then the priest themselves. So the, the ceremonial laws pertain to the religious things, the religious rites, all the festivals, the feasts that were uh, commanded by the Lord, and all the ceremonies and everything that they were to do in worship and service to the Lord. How the sacrifices were to be, what the sacrifices were to consist of, uh, how they were to be offered, the roles and responsibilities of, uh, as I mentioned, the priest and then uh, all of the, uh, the different uh, uh, feasts or festivals. So that is a ceremonial law. Then we have the moral law. And uh, that kind of the core is the, what we call the Decalogue or the Ten Commandments that we looked at previously. That these ethical standards, because they're based on the character of God himself, right? Now, there's morality found throughout all, but there is these particular sections that are moral laws. And these are on honesty and justice and, and so forth. So let's look at these a little bit uh, closer here. Like the civil laws, uh, the dealing with disputes between individuals, just how to get along with each other. And that was how the nation of Israel was to operate. And it is kind of, and I said expired, but it's really on hold now because what we have as a nation Israel today is not the Israel in the biblical text. It is a, a nation state, but it's, they're not following the Lord. They're not the true Israel. Um, that's a whole different uh, ball of wax to break into. But it's been put on hold, but it will be reinstituted uh, at least in, again, in the millennial kingdom. Uh, but that has to do how, do, how do you treat the poor? That's Leviticus 19, 15. Uh, treating the cattle of your neighbor is <laughs> Deuteronomy 22, 1 through 4. Uh, how to deal with children and if they're rebellious and what to do with debt and the laws of divorce and how one is to dress and present themselves and uh, what to do with the inheritance and uh, uh, property, uh, murder, killing, and uh, using correct measurements in commerce and uh, so forth. And so though that, those are the, the civil laws that deal with the theft and also with warfare. And then we get into the ceremonial laws, and that's the service of worship or sacrifice. Um, and those expired with Christ fulfilling them, but I believe the law is going to be re-implemented, possibly in the seven-year tribulation period, but, but at least in the millennial kingdom, because there are bountiful verses that, uh, that tell us that the millennial kingdom will be under the the Mosaic law as well. But the ceremonial laws have to do with worship and how you're qualified to even worship the Lord, such as if you had leprosy, you could not offer a sacrifice until you were deemed clean by the priest and have specific uh, rules on that, on how a leper was to be uh, treated. And then all the festivals, and then uh, laws on animals for food, what you could eat and you couldn't eat as far as being clean. Uh, the Law of Atonement, offerings, the priests and their consen consecration, 
uh, the priestly duties, the regulations for the priests, and then the various sacrificial offerings that were offered. And uh, let me see, do I have that? No, I think I might get to that. Let's see. I wish sure I had that somewhere. There's the offerings. Okay, we will get to it. So then there is the the moral law. And as we said, that's based on God's character, contained within the Decalogue mostly. Yeah, but there are other pieces that we find in us about just how you, what the Lord expects from you. Now, uh, we read, uh, you shall be holy for I, the Lord your God, am holy. You shall have no other gods before me. Condemns idolatry. You are to love God. You are to love your neighbor as yourself. Uh, you're not to oppress your neighbor and about how to treat and sacrificing of children to Moloch forbidden. Sexual sins, I, uh, adultery, incest, bestiality, homosexuality. Interesting, all of these were included in the Old Testament, didn't it? Sexual sins, adultery, incest, bestiality, homosexuality, all of these are included there. And so it seems that as we look through this, the civil law and the ceremonial law has been put on hold since the dispersion of Israel and Judah, that is in 1722 when Israel went to Assyria, were taken captive and then dispersed throughout uh, the different nations. And then in 586, when Babylon conquered Judah and they were dispersed. And um, Israel really has not reconstituted prophetically yet. So it's still kind of on hold. Um, it's because they rejected Yahweh Elohim and they are still in rejection of him. They rejected him, the Lord, his words, and his ways. And uh, But what can be said, and this is how it applies to us today, is that the moral attributes of the law are still intact because the Lord is still the same today. Okay, So the moral attributes, and we're going to look at that just a little bit different. The moral attributes are still in effect. So what we want to ask you is this. What was there before Mount Sinai? Before the Mosaic Law, what was there that humanity gauged themselves to know whether it was sin or not? Right? What was there? Everyone thinks it's very popular to think, well, there wasn't this kind of regulation or understanding until the Mosaic Law. But people had to understand that there was sin before the Mosaic Law. What was given? Well, we have the whole of the book of Genesis. And in it, there are these moral uh, commandments. And they're called the, the Noahic Code or the Noahide Commandments uh, that existed uh, before uh, the Law of Moses. And uh, we're going to look at that because it's really kind of interesting. So uh, before uh, the Mosaic Covenant, there were these ethical codes that was in, embedded within Genesis. And once again, look at it, Noah Code and Noahide Commandments, and this is really important because these apply to you and me today. They were pre-existent to the Mosaic Law, and they are in, a, in effect today, and uh, they are also incorporated into the Mosaic Law. So they were reiterated into the Mosaic Law. So here's a list. I think I have the seven, yeah, the seven uh, Noahide laws here. And that is belief in the Creator God. Do not worship other gods or idols. Do not steal. Do not murder. Do not engage in sexual immorality. Don't abuse animals. And that they were to establish a system of justice. Now, these aren't in a list in Genesis but they are in the book of Genesis that the Lord had required man to not do these things or to do these things. And when he did them, he was punished. For instance, was it a sin for Cain to murder Abel? Yeah. Was there a law? Well, yeah, there was. They knew that they were not to do that. 
there was a sacrificial system that was implemented and that they came to regularly. So these things pre-existed the Mosaic Law. And because they pre-existed, they are not just for the Jew, right? They're not just for the children of Israel because these precede that. And also, the covenant that the Lord made with Noah is everlasting for the world, for all people, and not only all people, but all animals. And we looked at that in this study uh, on that, uh, that, that age of uh, human government or civil obedience. So uh, I just thought this was really important for us to see that pre-existing the law, right, the law of Moses, we had this in, in, the, in Genesis that the people were to adhere to. And there are uh, major equalities between these two. You can look at them and see how similar these seven are to the Ten Commandments, right? You can just look at them and see. No, right? One God, worship one God, no idols. Um, uh, and that is to respect the Lord and honor Him and serve Him. Uh, no sexual perversion, uh, uh, no murder, no theft. Right? Uh, don't abuse animals in a system of judgment, uh, justice and so forth. So you can see what's interesting is that these clearly, these seven no hide uh, commandments, uh, clearly reflect the moral laws that are given in the Decalogue and the rest of the law of Moses. So it's important for us to realize that, that this is based on the Lord and what he expects from mankind as a whole. So these have not gone away. Although the children of Israel might have the Decalogue and 600 other commandments, mankind is still held to what was not for the Jews, but was for all of humanity. So we are still responsible to adhere to at least these seven no hide commandments and I think that is important for us to understand that they're still in effect for us today because there's this misconception that oh the law is done away with so you know we're there's nothing to regulate us only what the New Testament says well good for you good for you but the law hasn't been done away with it's been fulfilled and that's different the law has been fulfilled but it hasn't been done away with. It was just fulfilled in Christ. So as a synopsis, uh, we're going to read here. Uh, we went through that. Yeah, you shall be holy for I am holy. This is the moral laws of, of the Lord God. Uh, uh, against idolatry, you're to love God, love your neighbor yourself, oppress your neighbor, don't oppress your neighbor, stealing, lying, sacrifice children, and sacrifice children, more like sexual sins, and so forth. Those are still in effect today, and humanity today is still held accountable to these, and these are not based on Christianity. We need to get that in our head. Right? It's not about church. It's not about Christianity. It's about this is the creator God who is holy saying this is the way humanity is to react and respond to me regardless if you're a Jew or a Gentile. It has nothing to do with political affiliation. It has nothing to do with denominational affiliation. It has nothing to do with when you were born, it has nothing to do with if it's before Pentecost and Acts or after Pentecost and Acts. It has to do with you, wherever you are in humanity. This is what the Lord expects from you, and you cannot escape it. It's important for us to realize that. We put so em much emphasis on, oh, this is what it means to be a Christian. No, figure out what it means to be created and responsible to your creator and how you are to approach him. That's what it's all about. Okay, I'll get off my soapbox. 
So remember that all of these are applied to all of humanity, includes you and I today. The characteristics of the Lord God do not change. Right? God doesn't change. Humanity's perspective may change, but the Lord God does not change. Okay? And uh, we read it in Hebrews, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And then James 1, 7. I have these somewhere. Where is that? Gee, there it is. And then James 1, 7. Every good thing given and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation, nor shifting shadow. So there you go. God's the same. His expectations for humanity in general are the same and how we are to respond to him right so we need to just get that in our head the lord has expectations on us today that has nothing to do with where we are it has to do with who we are and who he is so the review is basically this um the law can refer to the first five books in the old testament or it can revert to the specifically the Mosaic law given on Mount Sinai. So we have to look at the context in the scriptures and how it's used. But regardless, right, regardless, um, the Lord has had one desired outcome, and it's specifically from the Mosaic law. And that was to show the people... This is important for you to grasp. The outcome that the Lord desired for the Mosaic Law was for the people to realize that they could not achieve sinlessness and they needed a Savior. They were supposed to realize they could not keep the law. Right? They needed a savior. They needed that promised seed. There is no one who will be in heaven because they kept the Mosaic law. They will only be in heaven because they are in Christ. We'll get to that in just a second here. But the, the, the law was given that it might lead them to Christ, to show their need that they cannot on themselves be holy. They in themselves cannot be sinless. We read in Galatians chapter 3, here, verse 24 and 25, says, So then the law was our guardian until Christ came, in order that we might be justified by faith. Now that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. That's exactly what Galatians 3 is saying, is that the law was to show the need for Christ. Not the Gentile, but specifically the Jew. That they could not attain sinlessness or justification through the law. It was to lead them to the one who could justify them. And that is Yeshua himself. And that's what it means. So... It led uh, led them to as supposed to lead them to Christ. Um, the offerings that were offered, and we're going to look at these here. You can kind of see this here. Uh, you might have to expand it a little bit, but of all the offerings, the sacrifices, right? Um, it was never a way to achieve eternal salvation because none of the sacrifices that were offered under the Levitical law the ceremonial law, actually forgave sin forever. It covered it until Christ. But there was no complete forgiveness. And these are the, the, the uh, and even the greatest of the feasts and the sacrifices with the Day of Atonement, when the priest would enter the Holy of Holies and sprinkle the blood of the, uh, you know, sprinkle the blood on the altar. And, that was only for one year for the nation, not for individuals, but for the nation of Israel. So here are the, the, the different uh, Jewish offerings uh, that were uh, the burnt offering, grain offering, peace offering, sin offering, and the guilt offering. These are five of the key ones. Uh, but none of them were permanent. 
None of them were permanent. Okay? Only Yeshua, Jesus, in his death, burial, and resurrection can atone for sin eternally. And the law of Moses was to lead the children of Israel to the Lord as Savior. And this is illustrated numerous times in the biblical text in the New Testament. Uh, Hebrews 7 illustrates that Jesus fulfilled the law of Moses and that he is superior to the law. Um, and as Jesus is greater than the law and superior to it, it only makes sense that we should follow him, not try to do things right on our own, but follow him. So uh, the law of Moses, uh, you know, had its purpose, but it only temporarily covered the sins of the people. And that's important for us to realize. So why would we want to try to prescribe things in the law to Christians today? But there are a lot who want to do that. You need to be satisfied with what the Lord has provided. And that is, he's provided himself. And Jesus said here, let's see, do I have that? Nope. Jesus himself said, I give unto them eternal life. This is John 10, 28 through 31. I give them eternal life and they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I and the Father are Echad, one. Yes. You know, I keep reading, there's some dude on, I think he's Muslim, on these videos, and he's saying, did Jesus ever claim that he was God? Yes, here it is, right here. And this is John 10 and verse uh, 30. And it says, I and the Father are Echad, they're one. So, yeah. Jesus is claiming to be God. He's one with the Father. So there you go. In Matthew uh, chapter 5, Jesus says, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I did not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. And it's not that he kept the law. That's not how he fulfilled them. Jesus didn't fulfill the law by keeping the laws. He fulfilled the law because they pointed to him. Right? Got it? The law pointed to him. He fulfilled it. He made them complete. He completed them. The law with the law was only to point to Yeshua himself. He fulfilled them. It wasn't about his obedience and keeping them. It was about he was who he was. He fulfilled them. He is the promised one. So whether the law is referring to the first five books of the Bible or those specific uh, commandments handed down from the Lord God, uh, through Moses to the children of Israel, it all points to Yeshua. Everything points to the Lord God, points to Jesus, because he is the plan, and he is the promise. Wow. Well, we covered a lot of material here, and we're going we're gonna to look at the law a little bit further, uh, but I just wanted to kind of give you that kind of an outline and overview of what the law was and what it was given for. It was given to a specific group of people. That's the Mosaic Law, the commandments, were given to a specific group of people and, uh, uh, and for a specific reason. It was to lead them to Yeshua. And uh, we need to just be very clear in our mind that you know, the Lord has his plan and his purpose. And I just want to thank you for joining me today. And I hope to see you next time here on the Cosmic Bible, God's Word for today and beyond. And as always, remember, know the truth, stand on the truth, and speak the truth. God bless you.